Three, two, one. Click on that button. Blah, 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 blah. I believe we are now live, and I don't have any echo on myself, as far as I know. Please let me know if uh, it is freaking out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, welcome to those old and new uh, folks. Oh, thank God, no echo. Thank you, Amy. Um, so yeah, we're coming back with a new version of a curriculum I did in the past, um, which was a little more loosey-goosey. Now I've got PowerPoint slides and drawings to do, and uh, I think it'll just be a little bit more interactive and a little bit easier to pick up. So I am excited to have you along with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Haley. I work as an information security engineer for Charles Schwab, uh, but also try to do a lot of tech education stuff on the side, hence all of this. And um, yeah, just a little bit about where I came from. I didn't uh, start with computers, although I was introduced to them as a young age, but I used to be an animator and I drew cartoons for a living. And as fun as that was, and yes, I got to follow my dreams and draw cartoons, it was 80 hour weeks, 40 hours of pay, and the pay wasn't very good, and uh, it made me draw a lot less uh, on my own time, because I, I was just sort of out of juice at the end of the day. And so, to try and make a long story short, uh, quarter life crisis, moved in with the parents, uh, got really interested in urban gardening and uh, bicycled across the country to film a documentary about aquaponics. And uh, yeah, started living the rat race as a receptionist. But during that time, a wonderful human who may be in this chat right now, uh, we were talking about my rat race life and $10 an hour just wasn't cutting it for, uh, you know, doing all those things I want to do with my life. And so he was like, well, you can do what I do. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, you're a hippie artist friend. Well, like, how, how much do you make? He's like, well, I started at $40 an hour, but now I make 65 and I'm pretty sure my eyes did the, like, cartoon cha-ching with the money sign pupils um, because we arranged to start um, doing mentoring sessions the next Monday. And we did that every Monday for about a year and a half. Well, I studied for this certification called the Security Plus, uh, which we'll talk about certs later on. But uh, what I'm trying to get started with here is just like an approach to learning information security because it's kind of there's it seems like a lot, but uh, ultimately it's a space that has rules and there are systems in it that you can learn, and there's a systematic way to learn that I think a lot of us were never really introduced to. And I mean, just in the past few months, I've recently learned a lot about learning and uh, I just thought that'd be a really good place to start before getting too lost in the weeds of the cybersecurity job. I am going to start a timer because I often go over. Okay. Nice. Not too bad on the intro. So that's a little bit about me started a curriculum and uh, I think six people stuck around for a while and they all have jobs now. Uh, and then I was doing a class for nobody. So it gave me some time to sort of build this up and I think you will uh, get a lot of out of it, hopefully. So all that to say, let's switch to see what's on my screen. Um, ooh, is that PowerPoint? Uh, close enough. It's LibreOffice Impress, which is a freer version. Ooh, wow. Okay. Ta-da! Cybersecurity skills under my head there. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. Uh, sort of three main categories I broke this up to uh, is problem solving, systems thinking, and building systems. Uh, I think once once you sort of see that uh, what problems exist in systems, then we'll be able to solve for some of them, solve for some in our own, uh, of our own, and then build something that works for us to sort of start ingesting InvoSec knowledge in a steady drip that we uh, 
you know, build along the way. So problem solving is something you do all the freaking time. I think there's this, there's this perception for, for tech. Oh, of course it's not showing my slide for whatever reason, but it just says problem solving. Um, it's something you do all the time. And I think, uh, tech and art in particular are two things where it's like, oh, I'm not an artist. Oh, I'm not a tech person. But really it's just that you didn't have a natural curiosity or passion or reason to sort of follow those things and start solving problems in that space. And that's the only reason you're not one of those people. Those people just had one of those inclinations that drew them into the systems. And as they understood more and more, they were able to do it a lot better. And you've done it with a zillion things. When you learn how to drive a car, uh, you know, that's a, that's a system that you're learning to solve. And first it's, it's, you can read about it all you want, but when you first get behind that car, it's uh, kind of terrifying because there's so many systems you're thinking about so many things. And then now you, you basically blank out while you're on the road um, because you've utilized those systems so many times, you know, what's important and where to look and what to do. Uh, is the, is it really not transferring my desktop? Why is this? Okay. There's my desktop. Uh, I wonder if I do maybe not full screen. I'll just do in a window and see if that works. Uh, that's better. Uh, at least it's there. Um, so yeah, problem solving is basically puzzle solving. I, I think framing things in terms of puzzles is a lot easier and a little bit more accurate because, uh, problems is a very loaded word. And, um, uh, my, it looks like my mom can't hear, but mom, probably a technical issue. I believe in you. You're going to figure it out. And, uh, I love you so much. And, uh, so thinking about things in terms of puzzles, I think a lot of us are, uh, used to solving puzzles and problems in our own life. And thinking in that way can help us approach tech, um, as just another puzzle. And you're just not as familiar with the rules of that puzzle and how the pieces fit together. But the more you spend time in that space, the easier it's going to be. This is really frustrating that this doesn't have a side window so I can see the upcoming slide. But, um, tech has endless puzzles. There are so many little creative uses for tech of like, oh, I want it to do exactly this with this that no one has done before. Uh, github.com is a code repository where people publish, you know, open source code that other people can download and, uh, make their own fork of the code and make it do something else. And, uh, I mean, there are literally endless puzzles. It's, it's kind of a creative act to come up with a puzzle for tech to solve. And, uh, even as an amateur, there's still going to be a zillion puzzles you can devise and create on your own. And I think that's one of the really cool parts. Um, something I thought was very interesting, um, when I was researching is the de definition of an amateur. And yeah, we're kind of used to these here, like, oh, they do it for pleasure rather than professional reasons. Uh, uh, they don't do it for money, uh, and they're not really good at it. But then when I looked at the root word, equivalent to amare, to love, an amateur is a lover of a thing. I think <laughs> at some point there's been a disconnect between, uh, you know, loving to do something and, uh, finding out how to do it or understand something and, uh, and making that jump to professional. Like we just see it as unskilled or you get paid. And I think, uh, a lot of us that are professionals in the field consider ourselves amateurs, uh, as, even in the unskilled sense, uh, because we realize how much there is to learn and it's kind of just endless, uh, which is kind of cool. But, uh, as you arm yourself with more knowledge, you get more and more dangerous, uh, as you're able to make links between these various things. So back to the slides. I really wish I could do the custom slideshow. Ah, 
and now I can't stop the slideshow. Oh well, here we go. I'm just going to look in shock as each slide comes up for the first time. Uh, so, uh, all that to say, uh, that reminds me of a quote I really like by this Christian anarchist and pacifist, uh, Leo Tolstoy. And he said, love is life. All, everything that I understand, I understand only because I love. And I thought that's like a really cool statement because, uh, if you think about what you love and who you love, it's often because you understand those things, like uh, a person that you love, you understand their faults and why they are the way they are, but you still love them. So understanding becomes this way to like encapsulate something and sort of uh, be, in, be in step with it. And uh, I think there's an interesting corollary to learning something where if, if you develop a love of doing the thing, not necessarily the thing, uh, as an abstract all together thing, but the love of doing it or interacting with it, it's a, it can get those neurons firing a little bit easier as you're, you're more receptive to trying to understand the systems you're encountering and you're going to hate what you love <laughs> a lot as you encounter it. But, uh, those Eureka moments when you figure something out and getting, get something working is, uh, it's worth all, all the pain. Um, so next we're moving on to systems thinking and I am doing okay on time, maybe going a little too fast, but that's okay. I'm happy to have you along. So, uh, systems thinking is, is a way of thinking about objects, not as just discrete objects in and of themselves. Everything is kind of defined by everything else. So another way of thinking about understanding is relation. Like the things connected to that are kind of how you understand it all together. You kind of need everything else to explain anything else. Um, and, you know, thinking about things as systems can help us understand how computer systems work, but also, uh, we are a system, our relationships are a system, behaviors are a system, the organs in our body are systems made of cells that are systems that interact with nature that came out of nature. That was a system. It's systems, system, 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 systems at every point. And it becomes a useful way to think of knowledge rather than like, Oh, I know computers. That's way too broad of a thing to say, or even just, uh, you know, literally anything we talk about, you can't just say, you know, X it's, there's so many subdivisions of X there. There are things about X that, you know, but, uh, thinking about knowledge is like a list, like, Oh, I know this, this, and this, um, is less useful than thinking of it as like systems that interact with each other. And you know how some of those dynamics work. So this came about from a smart fella named Gregory Bateson, uh, systems theory. And basically what he was getting at was that things are ultimately their relationships and their dynamics. They aren't discrete objects in isolation. And, um, this became really useful in, uh, you know, all sorts of industries in, uh, ecology, economics, uh, even therapy, understanding like the person in therapy as part of a system, uh, out of their family. Um, but, uh, yeah, with tech, we're going to be dealing with lots of systems. So I think thinking in systems is a really fun way to sort of like, uh, figure out what to learn next, or like you're constantly unraveling the threads of things that you can follow. And the more you do that, the more you'll sort of understand more of the dynamics and you'll be able to come up with answers to questions and come up with better questions uh, that don't have answers. So to, to like actually give a technique to do this, um, when we're looking at things we aren't familiar with, uh, it's a good idea to think about things in context of other things that you know, or, or that you may not know yet. And so when we're looking at something we don't know, we're, we're thinking about how and when do I use this? Like, 
it can do a thing, but also when it's supposed to be used is really important. Uh, the order of operations can be can make a difference in you know, getting the result you want. Like maybe you want to trim down the data first before you search all the data, because searching all the data would take a really long time. But if you trimmed it to something that you just need to look at these pieces, um, the the searching would take a lot less time. Uh, and then problem solving. Oftentimes in like tech articles and like how like how to do something, which uh, as professionals we look up all the time, but it really helps to look at those articles in like why are they telling me this then this? If you're just sort of following the steps, you can sure you can Google it, read the steps, do the steps. But if you're thinking about well, why did they tell me this step first? Why, like, what is that interacting with? And why is that doing something? And then why is this step next? And um, this sort of way of, you know, then when you're looking for, for quick answers to a lot of your questions, because a lot of us IT, pe IT people are basically uh, professional search engine folks. And, uh, you know, you're going to do that too. It's, it's going to be a lot of that. But while you're doing it, you can sort of learn more about things just by the way you think about things that you're reading. And um, lastly, build, you can build your own neurons. That's going to help a lot. Uh, you could just, you know, read the steps and uh, thinking of it with context and problem solving why they did things. But if you are sort of hitting the wall yourself and breaking that wall with your own forehead, uh, the, the amount of dopamine that your brain produces to reward you for like solving that problem, which is what your brain is evolutionarily designed to do. It is a problem solving machine. When you get that reward, all those neurons that you were sort of like creeping in to your neural net, they get a rush of dopamine like, yes, we did it. Learn that. Remember that. And, uh, so, yeah, it's always going to be a balance. You're always not going to know how to do everything, but uh, solving things yourself a lot of times is going to make it stick a little bit better. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. So uh, I don't know if you saw this quote uh, in the previous slide. Um, Turtles all the way down is a really funny phrase that I think relates to systems thinking. And uh, the premise of the story, apparently this has been around since like the 1500s, but, you know, some guy's telling, well, they've got this religion, and uh, on top of the world elephant sits the world, and then the elephant sits on the world turtle. And then the person's like, well, well, what's, what's under the turtle? And <laughs> it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> And I think that's a good way to think about systems thinking, because literally you could never find the bottom. If you relate each system to each system, you're just going to keep going turtle to turtle to turtle to turtle. Um, so to illustrate that, I got a little doodle. Uh huh. So, oops. So, yeah, why not? Purple. So if we say uh, the web browser uh, showed us google.com, we typed it in and we went to Google and the web browser showed it to us. That's a really, uh, hey, Ricky, welcome to the club. Um, so that's a really simplified description of what the web browser is doing. If we start tearing into this, it just, it's, it's, there's so many turtles. Um, this is a very common interview question of what happens when you type google.com and press enter. And you can get all the way down into like how the electrical signals are firing off the keyboard presses. Um, but if you just say, well, the web browser loads the page, it's a 10 second answer and you're probably not going to get the job they're hiring you for. I was able to ramble for like 20 minutes to get my job, and uh, that, that was pretty okay, I think. I don't think it's a race, but uh, I know some people who could easily go two to three to probably a full day session explaining just that. Uh, Ricky, we're going over cybersecurity, but uh, nature is a system too, so it all kind of works the same way. But I mean, the web browser is speaking HTML. 
JavaScript, CSS, uh, PHP. It, it has all different ways to decode all of these different languages that could come back. And I mean, those are subsystems in and of themselves that have their own grammar and their own language. But then it's also, we could think it's talking to the uh, network stack, um, which is known as the, or parts of it are part of the OSI model, which is the layers of networking that uh, sort of make everything go on the internet. But that's part of the network stack of the Microsoft operating system. And uh, I mean, you, then you can talk about the operating system, and kernel space, user space, and that's just on on no, this side, <laughs> on the user side, on the Google side. Uh, geez, I mean, you're probably at first interacting with a DDoS prevention uh, system of some kind, just to make sure they're not getting hit with uh, spam or attacks trying to take down their systems with overloading them with requests, and then maybe going through a firewall from there, which is again, you know, only serving requests that should be served. And then maybe to a load balancer uh, to make sure that it hits a system that can uh, take the request. And then maybe you're getting to a server that is ready to serve this request to this person over here. And they start talking through this network of systems just to make uh, like a Google search for cat pictures. And this is just a very simplified version of some of the systems interacting. I'm sure some of the folks on the call here could, uh, could ramble for hours on each one of these systems themselves, but uh, we'll just start there. I just want to give an idea of a tech example uh, where how many systems are involved. And I mean, it just, it, there's so many turtles. But uh, we get to learn about them, and each one we learn about uh, sort of gives us a be better picture of the overall thing. So uh, back to turtles. And then I think we're moving into... Yes! Uh, you might have pondered that you, yes, you are a system. And I, I think this is important to take into account because uh, um, I imagine there's some people watching that uh, dealt with something I dealt with and still deal with to some degree, and that's like mental health. And I think if you're going to be learning a new skill, uh, you do have to take into account that your mental health is probably going to affect your performance in some way. And so thinking of yourself as a system and what do you as a system need to uh, function and so I don't, you know, when you're learning something, there can be a lot of pressure, like, oh, I don't get this. Oh, I don't, I can't learn this. Uh, a lot of times it, it might just be, you know, creating a better system around you to help you learn and, uh, you know, not beating yourself up that it's not going to go at the same pace for everyone, wherever you are. I mean, it took me a year and a half and I have students that ran who my, through my previous class and in three to six months, they had slurped up so much content uh, that they got jobs three to six months after sort of like, well, I think I should study cybersecurity. And uh, there they are in the industry three to six months later. For me, it was a year and a half. I was kind of depressed at the time, but uh, slowly but surely we worked through it. And uh, and yeah, I just sort of wanted to throw this section in here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the body system that does things for us and uh, a little bit afterwards how we can make it work for us. So... Uh, I mentioned the prefrontal cortex before, and that's the front part of your brain that is uh, the thing we developed so heavily uh, compared to most other animals on the planet that now we have overrun it in a really impressive way and destructive maybe too, but also it's a really powerful tool is what I'm trying to get at, and it is literally designed to problem solve. And part of problem solving is decision making and long term behavior and like behavior uh, around your social group and like what's acceptable. And uh, the prefrontal cortex is noticeably underdeveloped when a person has experienced trauma. And granted, this is 
this isn't across the board. Everyone doesn't react the same way to everything. But statistically, people who have experienced more trauma, there's like the adverse childhood experiences checklist. Generally, the more of those you have, the more likely your prefrontal cortex is going to not light up as much. The good news is that the brain is super able to adapt. And as you train it with new things, it can change its patterns. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're not all the same. We don't all work the same. So understanding how we work, uh, might give us a little, uh, leeway when we're trying to ingest this sort of stuff. So one of the main players in, in that whole system is the autonomic nervous system, which is controlling things that you don't think about. And sure, that's breathing and digesting, but really importantly, it's how your brain sends chemicals um, to parts of the body based off of what it's interpreting. Like, oh, what chemicals do I need? Do I need to fight or flight? Or do I need to chill out? Uh, and so let's just go over a few. There's five major states um, that I learned about anyway uh, with this particular system. And so let's just go over that real quick. So the first state is, uh, is where the zebra is just chilling. Uh, zebra is eating some grass, kind of unengaged, not many cares. It's a good state to be in. I think it's very difficult for humans in a modern society to be in this state, especially when you're worrying about money, your kids, your parents, your family, your friends, your relationships. It's very difficult to actually hold on to that state. And I think uh, that's why a lot of us, you know, feel tired a lot. <laughs> But uh, the more we can engage that state, the better for when we need the other states. And for example, this second state here, the medium cortisol state, um, that's where the zebra hears the lion-esque noises, like eating grass still, but like, did that grass quivering sound a little bit like that last time that the lion chased us? I'm just going to keep an eye on it while I eat the grass. And uh, it's basically a focus state. We actually want this state when we're learning. Uh, it's common for us to uh, generate some cortisol and, uh, and uh, sort of enter that focus state. So we're adjusting and learning so that we can do something in the long term. But then if, uh, if we're in that state all the time, we get real, real tired. Um, you can't function in that state forever. And so if, if you're working... Uh, you know, 40, 60, 80 hours a week, and you're using up your focus energy, your high, your medium cortisol states, when you get home, it's going to be real difficult to learn because you just, you've been in focus state for too long and it's going to be difficult to, in, to invest yourself in the material. So maybe that's trying to arrange your life in a way where you might be able to find windows where it's a little bit easier to do so. Next, we've got high cortisol. That's where the zebra's running. Lion is after them. Fight or flight or freeze or befriend, I think, are the two new words on the end. <clears throat> but um, that, hopefully, we don't experience too often. Um, trauma can sort of lock in some of those states in response to, to things. But that is a high-energy state that produces lots of cortisol. And we can only sustain that for even less time than we can do the medium level. Uh, next, beyond cortisol, then we start getting into the opioid states. And the fascinating thing is these are indigenous opioids. This is your body's own morphine that it can, it can create in response to things in your environment. So in the low opioid state, that's the zebra got got. They're sort of like dang it, like you can see in them the sort of like relaxation of the muscles and they're sort of like, they got taken down. They're thinking about the lives like, dang, I got all this way, got nabbed by the lions. But the thing about this low opioid state is that there is still a possibility of escape. Uh, maybe the lions start, cubs start playing rather than eating the zebra and the zebra is like, well, I'm out of here. But uh, there's an opportunity to change and uh, jump into the fight or flight state or, or so on and so forth. But then you've got the high opioid state, and that is where the zebra is checked out. That's where its arm is on the floor. And, you know, it's what are you going to do at this point? Uh, and the body has this really helpful mechanism to be like, well, you probably don't need to feel all this pain while you do so. And, uh, you know, 
this is fascinating. You know, animals work like this, but humans work like this too. But we're prone to diving into these states in things that are technically our brain trying to solve the puzzle of our survival. But it can often work against us if we've ingrained trauma that brings us into these states uh, in response to our environment. Um, it's it's really difficult to you know have the motivation to study when you've worked so hard and you know you're so tired after work that you just want to watch Netflix and chill out and your body's probably like yes opioids here good job you you did it you made it let's just zonk out and i don't know if you've tried to think while on painkillers but uh it doesn't work very well um so basically all that to say there are strategies to get a little bit better um at this or at least improve our general uh emotional state and then we'll be better off when we you know try and invest time in a space to learn something new um so uh pharmaceuticals were a very good friend of mine uh like i said there it steers your brain around long-term pathways like you've got these responses for a reason your brain set them up for you to survive uh in in a system uh that maybe isn't working for you when you want to change it um so pharmaceuticals even though a lot of them like they got a bad rap and some of them will give you terrible, terrible side effects. I've tried a few antidepressants that made things far more depressing. Um, but if you find the right little cocktail, it can make your brain like give it a little room so that you're able to live your life a little bit better and maybe sort of try new things and maybe learn new things. Uh, second on the list there, we've got therapy. Uh, I feel like a lot of people have had bad experiences with therapists. And even as a person who has had great experiences with therapists, um, I've tried maybe a dozen and liked maybe, or loved, I'd say two and liked maybe one or two more. I don't think it's a one size fits all. It's really difficult to find someone who really gets you, but having a professional who's able to, you know, we all have friends who are either you know, the shoulder to cry on and they just listen and support us or they give us advice and a little too much of either of those things is going to sort of just confirm our biases and keep our patterns going. But a therapist is trained to sort of separate out sort of like, well, yes, you need a safe space to talk about these things, but also you need a mirror to look at yourself and your actions and think about what you could do differently. And lastly on the list, this is the one that People will tell people having trouble all the time, oh, just diet, exercise, and meditate, and you'll be fine. And the really frustrating part is they're mostly correct, and it's, uh, but those are very difficult things to build the willpower to do. Um, I'm still very off and on about all of these, but I would say meditation is my keystone habit. Like, if I can get meditation in, exercising and diet becomes so much easier to do. And I just do like 10 minutes maybe of just focusing on the breath. And, uh, it's weird how much better I notice my brain working throughout the week. Um, we'll talk later in a different episode about meditation and habit building, but, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, so I'm going a little beyond my timer, but, um, real quick. Building systems, building our own stacks of turtles. And so like how, knowing all this, how do I start learning InfoSec? Well, I think there is a fear that like, oh, if I just start diving in, I'm going to learn something I don't need. But uh, I think that every system you build is useful, not only because as you're building these systems, you're getting used to the idea of building a system and understanding this particular system, and then you can make corollaries to systems you learn in the future. I see it as sort of like a slumdog millionaire moments that like you realize, oh, that in the past sort of like came back around five years later and makes me good at X, Y, or Z. And it's, you know interesting to me that even as someone who is an animator, I notice a lot of my skills from animation and working in retail and a service industry, those skills uh, are serving me super well in the InfoSec world um, that I didn't, you know, I thought it was just all tech skills, but I feel whatever background you have, you probably happen to have developed a lot of useful skills that you're going to be using in tech. Um, forget the slide after this. Ah, yes, a cool little quote um, by the co-founder of Twitter and Medium. 
that the information we consume matters just as much as the food we put in our body. It affects our thinking, our behavior, how we understand our place in the world, and how we understand others. Yeah, I mean, kind of echoing a lot of the things I've said so far, but uh, I think it's a good idea to think of like what the information you're bringing to yourself is going to pattern how you uh, how you build from there. So we have all these things like Twitter and Facebook, and uh, a lot of them can be distractions, but in a lot of ways they can be super useful. Facebook, I can keep in touch with friends and family, and I just try to use Messenger now and not the app. But Twitter, for example, is an excellent place to get InfoSec content and follow InfoSec people and learn a lot of things from people who are super deep in a space that you can learn from. So... Uh, get a question a lot of how should I learn? And it's like, well, it's good to learn broad concepts and like overarching things. But I think especially for like building skills of like you doing something, it's really important to just set a direction and pick at that thing for, you know, at least two or three weeks, just keep digging at it. So you're building a deeper understanding of one system so you're not just hopping from like knowing what the system's names are. Now you're understanding the pieces of those, that system. And uh, I think two or three weeks was generally how long I would spend in a space. And that really helped me sort of like coalesce some ideas together around a topic. So this would be, you know, forensics, penetration testing. We'll go over some of the SOC jobs uh, very shortly. And then just looking at bite-sized chunks of that system, because that system is probably very, very complex. Maybe we just pick a few things or tools that utilize it or, or represent that concept and then just stick with it for a while. Uh, it's not going to feel good all the time when you're running into problems. It's, 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 your brain is going to want to solve it or it's going to want the answer. Uh, and, uh, I think just keeping the pace for a while is going to help you a lot in the long run in building a system that works for you. And I think that moves into drawing time. So I'm sorry, I over prepped for this first class. There are way more slides than I intend to be normally in this class. I normally want the lecture to only go 20, 25 minutes, but uh, I over prepared, which is good because that means less work in the long run. But I do want to go over with another drawing some cool stuff just about tech so you can get an idea of, you know, what some of the things in the space are. Uh, so let's pick a new color, maybe red. So a, a common phrase in, in security is the crown jewels. So that's sort of like what you want to protect in your environment. And you definitely don't want attackers to have. And so let's make the green things, the things that uh, are the ways in a lot of the time. So we can get in through the network. We could get in through machines. And we could get in through people. But thankfully, a big enterprise environment and a small environment, if they can, uh, are... are utilizing some tools at each one of these levels to try and keep that from happening. So on the network level, uh, something you might be familiar with is a firewall. Um, this is basically deciding what, what comes in and what comes out, what's, a, what's allowed in and what's allowed out. Um, your router, your home Wi-Fi router is doing this to some degree where like something on the internet can't just reach out to your machine and be like, Hey, uh, tell me your username and password. Uh, show me your internal webcam inside your network. Uh, the firewall's like, well, did, did anyone inside my network make this request? Uh, then no, I don't care. Um, so it's, it's an essential piece of any, uh, computer system to prevent unauthorized access. Another one, uh, some of us might be familiar with, uh, with, uh, business environments is the VPN or virtual private network. Um, there are some protocols like the remote desktop protocol where you literally just jump in and control a computer on the other end. Um, and attackers really like those, especially when they're not configured correctly. 
But a VPN, the idea is that you have, for example, like a username, a password, and a randomized token uh, with an app on your phone or it texts your phone, something along those lines where you have a few more authentication measures and then you are allowed within the network and it, it offers you a space within the network to do what you normally need to do. Uh, another one that I think is pretty cool is data loss prevention. Um, and, and, uh, thank you for following y'all. Uh, it's cool to have peeps that I don't think I know joining in. So data loss prevention, you could tag files on your network as like, this is important stuff. I either want to block when it's tried to be moved, or I want to know when it's moved. So you have a, an audit trail of where these important files are and who's editing them and who's doing what. So you could either block or you could detect and make alerts off of it. But uh, anyway, there's three tools. All three of these have probably huge teams in enterprise environments, you know, at least three or four people, but could be, you know, a dozen to 20. Uh, on the machine side, uh, we've got a few things. Uh, I mentioned before about uh, remote desktop being badly configured. And the cool thing is, uh, is that uh, oftentimes just the way you configure a tool and how its little systems work prevents that system from being exposed to access. Or you're able to block that from happening, or you're able to alert on when it happens. Um, another thing that might be a whole team of people is vulnerability management. And so, uh, you know, there are tools that maybe you can't take down right away. If a patch comes out for something, you might not be able to take down your production servers that run your app for, you know, thousands of people that use your app or your web page. So you have to know what vulnerabilities exist in your environment and where they are so you can sort of prioritize that. And what that leads into is patch management. So that's a whole nother team of making sure these systems are patched, putting things on a schedule so you're regularly patching things and making sure you're monitoring security bulletins and vendor updates so that you don't leave an open hole on your network. Um, there's a, a big enterprise VPN product, uh, Junos Pulse, that currently had an exploit, I think, release a month or two ago. And... Uh, now that there is a patch for it, now attackers know <laughs> that there's a vulnerability that is exposed, so they'll often build, uh, you know, scripts and things to just hit every IP on the internet that uh, is exposed, and it's like, hey, if it's a Junos Pulse network, let me know, because I'm going to crack it later. Uh, people is an interesting part of an organiza organization that we can also protect. Uh, part of that is with identity and access management. Um, which is like provisioning usernames and assigning permissions and roles and abilities to those usernames. And if you properly segment that, then you could, you could prevent attackers from getting in altogether where like maybe they only get access to a crappy user's name. But, uh, if they had access to an accounting person's username, they might be able to find some things that they shouldn't. Uh, so a well-provisioned network uh, and segmented network uh, can prevent a lot of that happening, or you'll, at least you'll alert when it's uh, when weird things are happening. Um, one that's pretty common, and thankfully we all have on our free email, is spam and email filters. So spam and phishing is still one of the top uh, ways that organizations are hacked is by getting a foothold through an email or a user clicks something, and then they're able to log in, connect from that server, and then escalate from there and move around the network. So a good email filter that filters out potentially malicious things uh, is going to just save you a lot of headache in the long run in case someone accidentally does click on something like that, or purposely, uh, which leads into security awareness. Um, some of y'all might work for big companies and it's pretty common now at this point for them to fish their own employees, like send false emails to their own employees to see who clicks, if they click, reward you if you don't click, that kind of thing. Because the idea is, you know, your security is only as strong as your weakest link. And I think, you know, there, there's, 
there's great value in training your employees to feel like they're part of the security program. And security awareness is, is a department in a lot of enterprise environments at this point. So those are just some, uh, some of the, uh, uh, things preventing attackers from reaching our crown jewels. Um, I just want to go over quick the sock and then just some links and then I swear I'm done talking. <laughs> there will not be this much talking in future classes, <laughs> but we'll be talking together. Um, so what I'm trying to train you for with this curriculum is for a position in the SOC, and that is the Security Operations Center. Uh, the cool thing about that position is it kind of requires a general know-how of the various systems involved in an organization and how security plays a part in each one of those. Um, so from there, you're able to pivot to a lot of interesting directions. Uh, so a way the SOC analyst usually just is getting a queue of alerts and they have to respond to those alerts and document for the business why this is bad thing or this is not bad thing. And depending on what they see, it leads to a few different departments. So one that they commonly interact with is incident response. And as it sounds, these are the people responding to incidents. When the SOC finds something they think is bad, they send it over to these folks to confirm, is this bad thing? If this is bad thing, incident response is trying to nip that in the bud as quickly as possible or monitor it and uh, get an idea of what it's doing. Uh, you might want a longer term picture but uh, bef before it does damage, but uh, incident response is handling that for the business. Uh, another team, and uh, you know, sometimes this is all done by the SOC analysts. It really depends on the org and how they're set up, is forensics. Uh, this is what I got initially interested in, but basically there's lots of fingerprints that, that can be left on system, lots of logs left over that can help you determine after the fact how they did what they did, um, if you're finding them later on in the attack. Um, so the forensics teams will often sort of deal with that and figure out how they got in so that you can plug the hole in the future, or they might be called in for legal issues, um, especially if there's a leak and sort of proving that due process was followed and that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes there's a malware team, if you're lucky. Uh, but what they do is they, if you find malware on your network, uh, it's not easy to just peel it apart and be like, oh, it does this. Um, so there are a lot of tricks of the trade that you can sort of break down uh, a piece of malware. And then you're trying to figure out what are its indicators of compromise, like when you see this thing, it's likely the malware that did it. Um, a common a common thing that malware will do is uh, is uh, like launch from something benign, like a Word document or a PDF, and then you click on the thing, and then PowerShell runs or a, or a command terminal. Like that's not supposed to happen. And uh, so finding indicators from mal malware can help craft alerts later on. And the uh, last one I've got over here, which I think is cool, is threat intelligence. And as it sounds, they build intelligence on threats. But what that means, often in practice, is sort of uh, learning Russian and Chinese <laughs> and uh, browsing the dark web to get ideas about what attackers are doing, uh, what are the sort of common methods they're using to attack, what industries are they targeting, and uh, sort of just building a picture to help the organization respond preemptively rather than after the fact uh, when they're hacked. And then all of that, all of these go back into feeding new alerts. And because then uh, we'll talk about the incident response lifecycle in a later class, but the idea is you learn from something every time that you see it. And it's a, it's a feedback loop that constantly gets better and better. So that system just gets better and better at detecting new threats. And uh, where do these alerts come from? Well, I'm glad uh, you asked. So a few of these are things like event logs. And these are different in Linux, OSX, and Windows. But uh, Windows, for example, has logs when a user account is logged on, or when a process is created, or 
when a network connection is made. And not all of these are on by de default, but you can enable a lot of logging that can then enable you to do detection on later so that in real time, as things are happening, you're like, oh, we've seen this pattern before in event logs. And now you're alerted to it when it happens. Um, one that probably lots of people are familiar with is antivirus. Uh, these have evolved in, in the past few years, and they do a lot of other things. Traditionally, they were just looking like, uh, people on the internet have found this to be bad, and we're letting you know you have that same file. <laughs> but uh, changing one bit of that file makes it completely different. So they've pivoted to some uh, behavior detection uh, activity, but uh, it's, it's another part of the stack. Another one is the intrusion detection system. A really common open source one is called Suricata. And basically, these are signatures, rather than looking at files, looking at network traffic. So if you have logs of your network traffic, you can find sort of interesting bits of information that you might want to know about where like, oh, uh, this is matches the pattern of this malware that a threat actor uses. It always, when it calls back to its home base, it has this pattern, and we saw it in this network traffic. So you can build rules for that and get additional alerts. Uh, oh, my favorite, my baby is endpoint detection and response. So EDR is like, you can get this from event logs to some degree, um, but the idea is to track individual processes that execute on a machine and track everything they're doing. So every network connection they make, you can trace it back to a process rather than just the computer. Like, because if you had network logs, you're like, well, I saw the computer do this. And then you're like, well, what thing on the computer did that? And that's what EDR is going to tell you. This process connected to this network connection, it made these file modifications and that sort of thing. So you can make really cool, awesome, another person joining the ranks. Thanks, Prion. And uh, so EDR just gives us a little more granularity on what's happening, and then we can detect off of that. All right, got Negihama too. Welcome, y'all. And last but not least, uh, I've got proxy logs here. And if you're not familiar with a corporate proxy, that's the thing that keeps you from going to things you shouldn't. <laughs> so for some companies, that's Facebook and Twitter, and the site is categorized like, hey, this is social media, don't let them go to it. So your machine is talking to the proxy first, and then the proxy gets the traffic for you and brings it back. So it can also be useful in a security context of preventing you from going to a known bad site um, by seeing like, oh, it looks like you're trying to request uh, evil.com. Let's not go there. And then you can also make an alert so that, uh, hey, someone tried to go to evil.com. Let me know. All right. So I think that is mostly everything. I've just got uh, a slide with some links at the end here. As I said, I talked way more than I intended to. I have like a little interactive quiz we could do, but I feel like I've talked for a real long time. Might just do some Q&A, but uh, just real quick, just wanted to go over some things we can learn from and then some sample links we could look at after the class and sometime before next week, Sunday, 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 same time, same place. Um, these are sort of my three things that I consider really helpful in filling out your picture. Um, Ingesting InfoSec news. So that's utilizing uh, Twitter, for example, a site called Peerlist, where people can publish articles. I like it because it's published by a lot of people in differing skill levels. So you get a really interesting picture of uh, what people think is important to talk about. And if you just sign up for the site and like fill in a few thing, tags you're interested in, you'll get a digest every week that just throws articles at you. Um, so for me, that was useful to learn some random things about forensics and penetration testing while I was learning, that I would just get an email every week and just click on a few things. Um, in my link afterwards, which is the syllabus, I'll have a few suggestions there. But uh, next we've got computer fundamentals. And this is kind of the boring stuff. You are going to have to like take classes and do homework and study for tests um, because Getting an idea of all the pieces just on your own can be really difficult, and there are some really great certifications to study for. Like, if you're completely new to computers, the, a the CompTIA a exam is about uh, hardware and computer troubleshooting. 
Next is the Network Plus, which is about network fundamentals, funny enough. And lastly, the Security Plus, um, which is, you know, the parts of the security organization and how that works. And I think it's really important to get those ideas of the pieces. Um, but uh, I've got that last thing bolded for a reason, because uh, that stuff is not going to stick. I mean, think about how much stuff you learned in school that you did as traditional classwork and how much of that stuck with you. So I think building and breaking stuff is super important. So like making projects, uh, attempting to do those projects, you're probably going to mess something up. And, uh, but then you're going to have to troubleshoot. And when you finally do get it working, that dopamine rush just solidifies those, those neural connections and it's going to stick in there a lot better. And the more you do that kind of stuff, along with what you're learning about, uh, you know, you'll just build more and more connections upon more and more systems and know way more about turtles than you ever thought you ever would. So, uh, yeah, recap of what we went over. Uh, I think there's a really useful technique I learned about recently where after you're, you're done doing something, uh, they found that learners who literally just think about what they just learned has way better retention than someone who studies the material over and over and over again. So, I mean, ideally at some point when there's more time, I would just play Jeopardy music and we might, uh, go over some of the things we learned, but, uh, what's that? Oh yeah. Problem solving. That is the first thing we learned. Uh, thank you person's voice in my head. Um, but, uh, we talked about problem solving, how things are like puzzles and, uh, you do problem solving in your everyday life. It's literally what your brain is for and it does it all the time. You just maybe haven't done it in the tech space yet. So get ready. Uh, next we talked about systems theory. Uh, just, I think it's a really helpful concept to truly understand how things work in relation to other things. Um, it ultimately, when you're spending time in a space, you might as well be thinking in systems because, uh, otherwise you're just going to keep learning the same material if you're not making the connections, uh, yourself between all that stuff. And lastly, we talked about, uh, well, we did also talk about yourself as a system and thinking about how you can, you know, maybe do some things for you that will help you get into learning and get into a learning space. Uh, cause I think that's really important. And then we talked about building our system, which is, uh, being like just picking something and being consistent and, uh, let's use our problem solving skills. We'll look at context and, uh, why this, then that. And then, uh, yeah, you just got to find some places to learn from, which I have linked in my syllabus, which we will be at shortly. Oh my goodness. I'm going so over time, but let's go over those links real quick and then we're done. And then a Q and a, if you want to, but, uh, thank you so much for joining me. So these are just three links, uh, for y'all to check out perhaps before the next class. The first is talking about the job situation in cybersecurity. I cannot stress enough how many jobs there are. And one of them, of the many substructures we talked about, you're going to enjoy one of them. I swear. There's got to be something you enjoy doing in here. And uh, so this article just explains sort of the dire situation the industry is in. There is a very short supply of qualified, competent professionals. And it's very unfortunate because universities are training these people, but maybe not giving them the skills once they graduate to get those jobs. And there's just going to be more. There's I mean, I'm so grateful to have a job right now in this crazy thing. And I, I have friends in cybersecurity who have lost their jobs, but, uh, there are lots of open positions. Uh, an article I think from two years ago mentioned 300,000 open jobs in the United States alone. That's insane. And when supply is short, demand is high. That means the price is very high and the salary is a very good. And, uh, Having a little bit of money can make things a little bit easier. The next article is The Paradox of Choice by this wonderful lady, Azuria. And that's a little bit about what we talked about, uh, how difficult it is to choose what to learn. Uh, she breaks it down a lot better than I ever could, but I highly suggest that article and then recalling afterwards, what did you learn? And then applying some of that, because uh, really it's just picking something and sticking to it. Uh, there's a lot of resources on the internet that kind of give you too much. 
and that can be really crippling to have so much, so many options. So uh, I highly recommend that article and why I've only given you three articles rather than 300. And lastly is just uh, an article I've kept on my blog for a while, just my general syllabus about how I think is a good way to learn. It's just a little more detail about where to learn from, what kind of stuff you need to learn, and uh, my general recommendations. I've had people follow that advice, and now they have jobs, and I'm so happy, and I hope that the same will happen for many of you. So... I think that's it. I do have a quiz I could run if people are really interested in sticking around. But uh, that's, that's my first class with way too many slides about things. Uh, looks like my mom wants to take the quiz. Amy wants to take the quiz. All right. Thank you all for joining, Yessie and Plops. Uh, I hope you learned something out of there, or you just enjoyed my particular brand of human being. Um, yeah, let's take a quiz. All right, let's, let's run this thing. So let me just, oh, that's the answers. You're not allowed to see that. Um, okay, classic mode. Okay. So I think, oh God, it's making sound. Okay, so let's switch back to desktop view. So this place is called Kahoot. It's kind of like Jackbox. Uh, basically you just go to kahoot.it either on your phone or on your computer. And uh, yeah, plug in that pin code and you will be able to put in your nickname and join in on a live quiz. Uh, so I'm glad some people were like, yeah, quiz, all right, because uh, I went way over time. But uh, I'll give you all some time to hop in there, either on a phone or lappy toppy or tabletty. Look, there's a ploppo ready to go. Yessie, ready to go. All right. I'll give it a few minutes. I saw a few takers in the chat there. Oh, we got Amy and blah. All right, all right. I'm excited to, uh, it's not just any old quiz. This quiz has animated GIFs embedded. So you're going to have a way better time than a normal quiz. <laughs> we got Prion in there, if I'm saying that correctly. And uh, Negihama. We got my mom. I think my mom is ready to learn InfoSec. I think uh, she might be a career pivoter. All right, I think those are most of the people I saw in the chat. I'll just wait a few more seconds. Uh, yeah, there's a few more in this room, but uh, if you don't want to take that quiz, it's all good. You're just missing out on the glory. All right, well, this is seventh direction education. We've got seven players, so that might be the chosen number. Let's do this thing. All right, here goes, y'all. These are real tough ones. Ooh, good question. She mentioned, I don't know if she mentioned this part going on in the GIF, but that was part of it. But uh, maybe she did some other things too. Huh? Is that, oh, we only got one answer. I think it's hard to like watch the screen and do it, but it should be on your phone or your laptop or whatever you're using. And you just answer on there with the little uh, icons on the bottom. So uh, looks like Blah was the only one who got in there. Blah is taking the lead. Uh, I used to be an animator, but uh, also all of those answers were correct because I used to be a janitor and a receptionist. All right, so if you're ready, you got to hit the little symbol on your phone or laptop. And... Uh, Use your this part of your brain to perhaps get the answer. Might need to put more time on the clock. Yeah, because we're only getting three answers, but I don't think we can do it. It's just going to be a lightning round, folks. Get ready. So, uh, yeah, we got someone who got the prefrontal cortex. Oh, Plopo used that prefrontal cortex, all right. 
And uh, y'all used it too, but uh, it takes a little training. We'll get there. All right, so this one was a was a quote that uh, little old me, it moved my heart a little bit. That might be a hint towards what it was. I mean, it could be anything. I understand only because I... Huh? I wonder if, yeah, more time probably helps. Love it! I love love it. <laughs> uh, whoever put love it, that still counts. I'm sorry, I can't just give you points. But, uh, yes, I only sh I understand only because I love. Good job, Nagihama. All right, true or false, is cortisol an opioid? Hmm, cortisol did something, but I think it made us go fast. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like we got a few people in on that one. But yeah, uh, cortisol, I'm not even actually exactly sure. I know it's a stress hormone, but uh, opioids are a downer. Cortisol is an upper. Uh, this one, you're sorting pieces into <laughs> the correct order. So this is where we talked about the order in which our autonomic ner nervous system sort of escalates uh, chemicals in our body in a certain pattern. So yeah, maybe I'm not putting enough time on these things, because... Uh... Ooh, corticosteroid. Thanks, Prion. That's a good word. Uh... I don't know if anyone got this one, probably because they didn't have enough time. Yeah, the correct order was calm, and then focused, and then panic, and then pain relief. Um, so yeah. Onward. Infosec jobs are in blank supply. There is blank demand. The salaries are... Salaries are... Uh... Hope this is worded in a way that makes sense, but uh, the idea is you can get an infosec job and make lots of money. So, short supply. Oh, infosec talent is in short supply. That's probably a better answer, but it looks like some people got it. Uh, yes, there is high supply. That was confusing on my part. Uh, there's a lot of demand, uh, not enough talent, and the salaries are high. But, uh, whoa, my mom pulling in the lead, y'all. Y'all need to step it up or she's going to take your job. Uh, learning from someone else who understands the material is better than solving the problem yourself. I mean, I took out the slide that specifically talked about this, but we I briefly mentioned this, and, uh, yeah, it's false. Uh, well, we'll go over in the next episode a little bit about learning and how the brain learns. But uh, when you solve it with your own neurons, like they built up a pattern in their own brain to solve that that question. So their pattern might not be, might not match one to one to how you learn something. So learning it yourself can be really helpful. All right. Systems theory suggests things and are there dynamics and relationships, not discrete, separate objects. Is that what systems theory said? What have we been talking about this whole time? I think that things are things, but so are other things. So all things are... Yeah. So that's the idea with systems theory. The things are their, ultimately their dynamics and their relationships. They're not discrete, separate objects you can sort of just separate out by themselves. All right, Negehama and Plops taking the lead. All right, two more, although the last one is just a poll. Uh, Haley's favorite definition of an amateur is... Huh? Yeah, this isn't enough time to read all the answers, huh? We'll fix that next one. But, uh, oh, look at all of you. You were listening. Yay. I'm so excited. Oh, Plop's on fire. But couldn't overtake Negihama in the end. So last but not least, I'm interested. Uh, 
you know, there's a, people in here of all different skill levels, so I'm a little curious how people are feeling about potentially getting into InfoSec. Um, yeah, every answer is a right answer. But, uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Huh? Huh? All right, I'm glad there's some excited and inexperienced mix that's totally valid. Uh, and, in fact, a lot of us are. But, uh, yeah, an amateur is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to be inexperienced. It's There's a lot of room for growth. But I'm glad some people are excited, and uh, it's okay if someone's unsure. I'm like, does, does Plapa Waffles really want to uh, change career at this point? Oh, wow, Mom, number three. Great job. Plop, number two. And on top, Negi Hama. Congrats, dude. That's awesome. Cool. I'm glad you all joined for this. I think it's a fun little thing to throw on the end of a lecture, but it probably is better if the lecture is more like 20 minutes than 50. So I'll be working on that for, for future classes. Sweet. Well, that's that, y'all. Um, I can hang out for a bit, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of hungry and, uh, I sweat a lot because there's a lot of lights on me and I was kind of nervous about how this would all go, but, uh, I'm so happy y'all joined me. Uh, yeah, do need more time on the answers. That will all come in time. Uh, cool. Uh, thanks y'all for joining. Uh, looking forward to, uh, keep learning InfoSec and, uh, what y'all get up to. Uh, feel free to reach out on, I've got my email on my website. You can hit me on Twitter, email, anything. And, uh, more than happy to, uh, give a little custom advice or love or support for you on your InfoSec journey. All right, y'all. I will see you next time. I think I just clicked this button.